Amen, amen. Praise God. I do count it a privilege and I do not take it lightly that pastors asked for me to speak this morning. That song, that last song we sang, it's a gorgeous song, beautiful song. The, 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 the one line that gets me every time, though, is you have no rival and you have no equal. You know, you gotta, you got to think about that a little bit sometimes. You have no rival. You have no equal. There is nobody out there that equals you, God. Satan, he's not an equal. He's a created being. There is no equal to God. Amen. And we need to understand that. And we need to get that into our hearts and into our minds, into our spirits, and say, okay, God, I understand you have no equal. So when I come to you, I'm going as far as I can go. You know? In our lives, in our jobs, there's always a chain of command. So if I am not happy with, or if I have a problem with a coworker, there is somebody that I need to go to. And then if they don't help me, then there's another person and another person. But the beauty about all of this is I don't have to go here, then here, then here. I can go directly to the top. I go to where there is no equal. The one that can do the work is the one that I am going to now, today. Amen? Praise God. Amen. Well, glory. Woo! Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, shatamaha, shatatamaha. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Open that for me, please. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, God. Well, praise God. Amen. That wasn't any part of my message. Pastor asked me a couple weeks ago if I would speak this morning. And I was, sure. And, uh, of course, as soon as he does, unless God's already been laying something on your heart right away, you start praying and saying, God, what is it? What, what, what do you want me to do? And what do you want me to preach? And before that service was over, God had laid this message on my heart. And I believe that this is what God would have us to hear this morning. I also believe that God has a sense of humor. Because if you knew anything about me, you would know that the one subject in school that I hated and had a very difficult time with was English. And God has chosen to use something from the English language for me to preach this morning. And what I want to preach and what I feel God has led me to preach this morning is the power of if. The power of if. When we take a look at the word if, it is a very small word, two letters. Not a very big word. And many times when we are reading, and especially if you have ever been taught to speed read, it is one of those words that many times you just glance over and keep on going. And as I was looking at this, and as God was laying this on my heart, I decided I wanted to, you know, we all know what if means, you know, I mean, we all supposedly. But I decided I'd go to the Cambridge Dictionary and see what it, how it defines if. And it defines if as 
we will be looking at it today in this, this following way. It is a conjunction. Okay? Now this is where I get all twisted up. Okay? Whenever they... You see, the reason I always had a hard time with English, the, the English language, is because the English language had all these rules. You know, this... It's always this way. It's always this way. And first, second grade, I was okay with that. Because I can follow, sometimes difficultly, but I can follow a rule. But then all of a sudden, they'd say, this is the rule, unless, or except. Now, wait a minute. If it's the rule, it's the rule. It's not the rule except here. It's the rule. And so it became a problem for me, and I struggled. Seventh grade, I actually got a scholastic improvement in English. Don't know what I learned, but I, somehow I got a scholastic improvement in seventh grade. That year, I guess, it clicked, and then it went away again. But the word if is a conjunction that is used to say that a particular thing can or will happen only after something else happens or becomes true. Okay? An example, I'll pay you double if you get the work done by Friday. Okay? So, you the, the problem is a lot of times we like to hear the, I'll pay you double, and we glance over that if. But yet that if is a very important part. Leo, you, you do contracting. If a customer said, Leo, if you get this job done by Friday, I'll pay you double. That if is a very important word, isn't it? Because what that means is, if he finishes it by Friday, his paycheck just doubled. But if... He doesn't get it done by Friday. His paycheck doesn't double. Little word. Big meaning. And we need to understand that. Or another example, we'll have the party outside in the garden if the weather is good. You see, as we look at this word, as we look at what it means, it is very, very important. It is as a conditional clause. It would be like um, on the condition that, or provided that, or as long as, or given that, or in the event that. All of those things would be a thought after the word if. As we read through the scriptures, we find many instances where if is used. In fact, because I'm this kind of a person, I have OCD, ADD, and a whole bunch of other letters after my name, I decided I wanted to see kind of how often if was used in the scripture. Did you know that the word if is in you? This was from the King James Version because that's the only exhaustive concordance I had. But the word if is used in the Bible in all of the forms, you know, word, that it can be used in approximately, and I'm going to say approximately because I may have miscounted by one or two, but it was 1,521 times. Pretty expressly used word. So if that's used in the scripture that many times, I would think that maybe, just maybe, there's a little bit of power in that name, in that word. The first time it is used in the Bible comes from Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire for you is for you, but you should rule over it. If, if you do well, 
Will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. If you do this, if you do it, this will happen. If you don't, this will happen. We can read about the faith that people had in God and how they trusted in Him. And when we do that, we see again the if showing up. Daniel chapter 3, verses uh, 16 um, through 18. I just learned something this morning. My notes, I make the scripture a different color. Orange is not the color to make it. Make mental note. Wife, make note. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If, there it is again, if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, there it is again, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had no fear. And when they were talking to the king and explaining to the king what they felt, they said, you know, if that is the case, if you are going to throw us in the fire, so be it. That's cool. Might be a hot furnace, but we're cool with it. Because we are going to serve God. So if you're going to do that, that's okay. Because our God can deliver us. But even if he chooses not to, we're still, O king, not going to bow to you, to your idol, to this gold image, or anything else. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood the power of if. Because they weren't going to be moved. They weren't going to be persuaded to do something that they knew God would not be pleased with. In Matthew chapter 21, we read where Jesus is talking to his disciples and uses the conditional clause of if. In Matthew 21, verse uh, 21 through 22, So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Church, we need to understand the power of if. We need to understand that there is something that is required of us in order for the promises to come forth. There is something that we must do in order for God's move to take place. As we read through the scriptures, we find many instances where if is used. We must begin to notice more what the scripture is really saying to us. 1 John chapter 6, or chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and, we, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Amen. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and he and his word is not in us. If we confess our sins, that means we must confess our sins. In order for the second half of that portion of Scripture to, to be true, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A lot of people like quoting that part of the Scripture. But they forget to quote the first, if we confess our sins. And church, they are sins. They're not mistakes. They're not errors. They're not a goof up. They are sins. And as sins, we must, as children of the living God, declare them as such. They are sins. Amen? Praise God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. This is a faithful saying, For if we died with the, him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Amen. As you read the scriptures, and you see, as I've just read several different verses using the if, and as I was talking with Pastor last night, he hit on one of the things that I was already going to, to do. And it was already in my notes. But there is also an if and a then. There is an if and a then. Many times when we read the word if, we will see the word soon, uh, the, we will see the word then shortly after. So, Isaiah chapter 58 Verses 13 and 14 says, If you turn away from me, turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Going to the next verse, then. See? If, then, you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Did you get that? He's saying here to us, here we are this morning on what we're calling our Sabbath day. The day in which we come to worship and to praise Him. Put verse 13 back up there for me. It's easier to read off of there than my yellow letters. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasures on my holy day. How many people do we know that are taking Sundays? Oh, it's one of my only days off. i got to have as much fun as I can. Turn away from that, doing your pleasures on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight. I don't know about you, church, but when I, I, I'm coming to church, it's a delight. I'm looking forward to feeling exactly what we felt this morning. To be able to receive from Him as He pours out His Spirit upon us. And it, um, it, it, if you turn your foot pleasure of your holy day and call the Sabbath a delight. Oh, jump back. You just jumped on me. The holy day of the Lord. Okay, now go. Honorable. Calling today honorable. When, it, when you hold something in honor, you don't just become flippant with it. 
It's special. It's, it's something that you hold dear to your heart. So when we call today honorable, and we honor him, not doing our own ways, nor finding our own pleasures, nor speaking our own words. Go on. Then, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you, that's God saying, I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Mm. God, let me realize just how powerful. Amen. Amen. Are you glad when we somebody calls and says, come on, let's go to church. Let's be in the house of the Lord today. That ought to be where we are. That ought to be our attitude. That ought to be our desires. Amen. Amen. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Very popular verse. In fact, you don't have to look far. You don't even have to look up there. You don't even have to look in your Bible. Just look right over here. It's posted on the walls of this church. Is another example of if and then. If my people. Who's his people? Everybody raise your hand. Amen. We're his people. We're his people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Oh, church. Oh, church. If my people, us, if my people shall, who are called by my name, what is that name, church? Jesus. If we who are called by the name of Jesus should humble ourselves. Uh oh. Hit the brakes. Humble myself? You know what? Pride will do more to damage your spiritual walk than anything else. There's a reason this scripture is here. If my people, who are called by my name, first thing we must do is we must humble ourselves. And what's the next part? Pray. Pastor, thank you for calling us to prayer. Thank you for taking and devoting Sunday mornings to prayer, to having a women's prayer time, a men's prayer time, and encouraging us to pray and to fast. The scripture says to humble ourselves and pray. And what are we doing when we're praying? We're seeking his face. And then, the next part, and turn from their wicked way. Listen, as long as these feet are walking on this earth, there's wicked ways. They're not glorified feet. They're not perfect. Oof, thank God they're not perfect. They're not walking on streets of gold yet. And there are wicked ways. There, you know, Satan has this way of trying to Get us maybe just to say some snide remark. Cause us to speak in ways that we shouldn't speak. Cause us to do things that we shouldn't do. Go places we shouldn't go. Look at things we shouldn't look at. 
act in certain ways we shouldn't act. But if we turn from our wicked ways, then, then will I hear from heaven. Listen, God hears us when we pray. God hears us when we pray. There are times that, you know, the pastor this morning just said, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, I wonder if the ceiling's going to be able to hold when, when the power of God moves like that. But let me tell you, sometimes we feel like our prayers bounce off the ceiling. But the scripture says, then he will hear us when we pray. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I don't know about you, but the land that we're living in, this earth that we're living on, is messed up. People continue to slide further and further and further away from God. And they're calling good evil and evil good. Does that sound familiar to you, Pastor? Does that sound familiar to you? Seems to me, I've read in the Scripture, they shall call good evil and evil good. And what are they doing today? We need to understand that there is an if and there is a then. And there is a power in that if. God has let us, His children, know what it is that He wants for us to do. And how we will be blessed when we do his desires. But, when we, but, but, but we can also see what will happen when we fall and fail to do his commandments. Because you see in all of these scriptures that I've read this morning. That if, is, in the ones that we looked at here were the conditional clause. We must realize that if... It is conditional this way, then the reverse would be true. Or it would be taking it in the opposite way. And we should decide to go, it would cause us to decide to go the opposite way from what the scripture tells us to do. So, that in mind, let's take a look here again at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. We're going to look at it the opposite. In other words, it would say this. It would read something like this. Since my people who are called by my name will not humble themselves and will not pray and will not nor seek my face or turn from their wicked ways, then I will not hear from heaven nor will I give their sin, or forgive their sin, or heal their land. Do you hear that? Big difference, isn't it? If we want to ignore that if, and ignore doing the first part, humbling ourselves, praying, seeking his face, turning from our wicked ways, since my people who are called by my name will not humble themselves and will not pray, nor seek my face, or turn from their wicked ways, then I will not hear from heaven, nor will I forgive their sin or heal their land. Church, we need to get in. And I, 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 I can't say it enough I can't thank pastor enough I can't get to the point drive the point home enough to you that we need to pray we want to see miracles done we want to see things happen you know a lot of people a lot of times like to say well you know the church is just, just the church same thing every week if you're coming with that in mind, you're missing the point. God wants to do something 
like He's done already today in every single service. Brother Antonio, one Wednesday night, got up and said, I know it's Wednesday, but let's just act like it's Sunday. God's here. You know, why is it that we feel that God can only move on Sunday? When we get together and we begin to seek His face, when we humble ourselves, we pray, we seek His face, if we do those things, God will begin to move in our midst. I'm going to tell you right now, sitting there this morning, knowing that I was going to be bringing the message, I didn't care one iota if God would have just taken over the service and I wouldn't have gotten up here to speak. You see, there is something about the presence of God. I cannot wait until that day when my feet are walking on streets of gold. I'm living with Him for eternity. Because there are times here on earth that I feel like I'm about ready to blow up because He's pouring so much of His Spirit on me. And I just, I just want to take more, but I'm, I'm almost afraid that, you know, I'm going to pop like a balloon. But the more we get, the more it splashes out of us, and it splashes on somebody else, and somebody else, and somebody else. Have you ever left a church service? Gotten to the restaurant, gotten to a store, been somewhere, and somebody happens to be close by you. And they turn and they look at you. And they, they realize there's something different about you. Because the power of God is just flowing out of you still. But in order for that to happen, we have to get through the if. We have to get ourselves completely and totally committed to God. Totally and committed, turned over, humbled, turned over. Praying, turned over, seeking his face. God, I want that in my life. And this morning, at the end of this, ser this message here now, I'm opening these altars. I'm opening these up so that you will be able to come. And you will be able to say, God, I desire to know you better. I desire to get myself to the point where I'm humbling myself to you. Where I am taking and I am praying. I, God, I, I need you. Church, if prayer is not a part of your daily routine, how? I'm going to be blunt. How are you living? How are you living a victorious life if prayer is not a part of your daily life. And prayer, as we saw last Wednesday night, we went through the prayer clock. We did it as an example. If you were here, you missed it. That's why you don't want to miss services. You never know what God wants to speak, what God wants to do, what God wants to show. But as we saw in that prayer time, there is a time in which we speak, and there is a time in which we listen. The problem with a lot of us is we think prayer is me talking to God, folding up my book, folding up my paper. This is all my requests. God, here, I lay them out, and getting up and walking away. I'm giving you the opportunity this morning to come to this altar to pray. I don't know where you stand spiritually. You know, you might have been in the church as long as this building's been here. And your walk with God may need a whole lot of help. Church, we need God's Spirit to move and to direct our hearts and our minds. The power of if. If, my people. Oh God. Don't let me just glance past that. Don't let me just fly by that and ignore it. 
church, this altar is open. Come, pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God. We praise you, Jesus.